Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you guys with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Okay, happy Wednesday, everybody. Of course, it is not a happy week for the families of the 21 people killed in a fire which broke out in a hospital in Beijing yesterday afternoon. The blaze was one of the deadliest the capital city has seen in recent years. The cause of the fire is under investigation. Now let's begin with the main stories. Yesterday, Tuesday, the National Bureau of Statistics published the official GDP growth numbers for Q1 this year. While we always need to take official numbers, especially during sensitive times, with a grain of salt, it is still useful to examine and unpack them. According to the official data, in Q1, China's GDP grew 4.5 percent year on year, 2.2 percent quarter on quarter, off a moderate base, largely beating expectations. And if accurate, would indicate that, at the macro level at least, China has well and truly moved out of the zero COVID period of growth headwinds. Though the legacy of zero COVID remains and can be seen in household confidence, corporate balance sheets, and unemployment, all of which will take longer to repair. As we will see, youth unemployment remains troubling, and debt levels too. As we move past the headline GDP number and look at the details, we do see a more mixed bag. As one commentator put it today, the data are not quite good enough to say China is booming, but also not bad enough to expect a shift in policymakers' views of the need for more stimulus. Another commentator, Tao Wang, UBS chief China economist, observed, quote, "Definitely, the recovery is on track." The momentum at the beginning of the year was stronger than expected. End quote. Retail sales were the biggest upside surprise, rising 10.6 percent year on year in March, up from 3.5 percent, the fastest pace in nearly two years. We remember that in Q1, the government rolled out various stimulus policies to boost spending in sectors such as housing and automobiles. Quote, Retail sales in China performed much better in March. Rising 10.6 percent versus 3.9 percent rise in industrial production. For the first three months of the year, retail sales were up 5.8 percent versus a 3 percent increase in China's value-added industrial output. This suggests that China is slowly beginning to see a pickup in the role of consumption as a driver of growth. We should see this trend continue and even accelerate in the next one to two quarters as we get a partial reversal of last year's terrible consumption performance. End quote. As was just mentioned, value-added industrial production was up 3.9 percent year on year in March, up from a 2.4 percent increase in the January to February period. Fixed asset investment grew 5.1 percent year on year in the first three months, down from 5.5 percent, and infrastructure investment increased 8.8 percent year on year in the first three months, down from 9 percent. However, the devil is very much in the details. Investments by privately owned businesses expanded only 0.6 percent in the first quarter from a year earlier, lagging behind the 10 percent expansion in investments by state-owned enterprises. This begs the question: How productive was this investment? Quote, the blow to confidence among the private sector is deeper and wider than we previously expected. End quote. Output in semiconductors fell nearly 15 percent in the first quarter, versus the same period last year. Pain in the property sector continues too. New housing starts plunged 19.2 percent year on year in the first quarter. Property development investment dropped 5.8 percent year on year in the first three months, down from negative 5.7 percent. However, in March, new home prices rose, albeit from a low base. At their fastest pace in 21 months, the debt numbers don't look too good either. Total social financing, a euphemism for total non-financial sector debt in the national economy, was up by 14.52 trillion RMB in the first quarter of this year, which is equal to nearly 51 percent of the 28.5 trillion RMB GDP recorded during that quarter. This is a fast pace, and then there is youth unemployment, which, as we can see, has surged once again, nearing 20 percent, 
for 16 to 24 year olds. Larry Hu, chief China economist at Macquarie Capital, observed on the data, quote, weak confidence remains the key headwind in the labor market as companies are reluctant to hire more workers because consumers are being cautious, end quote. Still, one in five unemployed young people remains deeply concerning for Beijing. Former and now current premiers Li Keqiang and Li Qiang have both prioritized increasing employment for China's surging number of graduates. Some commentators and even officials have warned that if this unemployment rate continues to grow, the country could face serious social unrest. Okay, now that we have unpacked the official numbers, it is indeed a mixed bag. The GDP growth number is good, and the surprising growth in retail spending is indeed a great sign. However, investment is largely state-driven, debt continues to surge, and youth unemployment remains high by PRC standards. On balance, though, assuming the data is accurate, policymakers in Beijing may finally be able to take a sigh of relief albeit only temporarily, as their biggest challenges still lay ahead. Stabilizing growth is just the first step to give policymakers the space they need to push through the tough reforms to tackle systemic economic challenges. Quote, Riding on this trend, we expect GDP in the second quarter to reach around 8%, and it won't be a big problem for China to achieve its growth target for this year. That said, we see some structural problems remain in unemployment rate, property investment, and confidence in private sector. These problems need to be solved to support a sustained recovery. End quote. Despite these nuances in the picture, however, state media couldn't help but take a victory lap, with the state-run Global Times writing yesterday after the publication of the headline GDP number, quote, China's remarkable economic performance serves as a slap in the face of Western media that badmouth China's recovery in the post-COVID-19 era. For instance, some media have hyped up deflation worries while others are undermining China's export and consumption prospects regardless of facts." End quote. Next up, the West and China. Hey guys, if you enjoyed today's episode of China Update, don't forget to hit that like button. Sharing and subscribing is a huge help as well. It's only me making these episodes every day. It's a lot of work, but your guys' support is a huge source of motivation, so thank you very much. As always, anyone who can go that extra mile and help keep the channel sustainable, Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee links are in the description below. There is also the Super Thanks function in YouTube itself. As always, thank you so much, everybody, for the ongoing support. This week, the European Parliament is holding a plenary debate on China policy called the need for a coherent strategy for EU-China relations. Yesterday, Tuesday, European Union Chief Ursula von der Leyen, who recently returned from Beijing, gave a speech that sought to play down divisions in the bloc's policies towards Beijing expressing, quote, We have consistently called for peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. We stand strongly against any unilateral change in the status quo, in particular by the use of force, end quote. Adding, quote, A strong EU-China policy relies on strong cooperation between members and institutions and willingness to avoid divide-and-conquer tactics we might face, end quote. Several speakers in the debate stressed China's ambiguous position on Russia's war in Ukraine and how this hurts EU-China relations, a point made by Joseph Burrell in his China speech which we examined yesterday. This week we learned too that French leader Macron has tasked his foreign policy advisor to work with China's top diplomat Wang Yi, quote, to establish a framework that could be used as a basis for future negotiations between Russia and Ukraine. End quote. Meanwhile, the G7 foreign ministers meeting in Japan has concluded, and, as usual, the meeting published a joint communique. The part on China was relatively long, and as we will see, has angered Beijing. Here are just some of the points raised in the communique on China. 1. We remain seriously concerned about the situation in the East and South China Seas. 2. There is no legal basis for China's expansive maritime claims in the South China Sea, and we oppose China's militarization activities in the region. 3. We reaffirm the importance of peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait as an indispensable element in security and prosperity in the international community, and call for the peaceful resolution of the cross-strait issues. 
There is no change in the basic position of the G7 members on Taiwan, including stated One China policies. We support Taiwan's meaningful participation in international organizations. 4. We continue to raise our concerns with China on reported human rights violations and abuses, including in Xinjiang and Tibet. We reiterate our concerns over the continued erosion of Hong Kong's autonomy rights and freedoms and call on China to act in accordance with its international commitments and legal obligations, including those enshrined in the Sino-British Joint Declaration and the Basic Law. 5. We call on China to act in accordance with its obligations under the Vienna Convention on the Diplomatic Relations and the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations. Soon after its publication, PRC Foreign Ministry spokesperson Wang Wenbin said the communique, quote, maliciously smeared and discredited China, end quote, adding, quote, the communique reflects the group's arrogance, prejudice, and deliberate desire to block and contain China, end quote. Wang then turned to a point in the communique concerned about China's expansion of its nuclear arsenal without arms control, expressing, quote, The U.S. and the U.K. are openly transferring nuclear-powered submarine reactors and weapons-grade, highly enriched uranium to Australia, end quote. And then, in a particularly harsh swipe at Japan, expressed, quote, I would like to stress that Japan, which holds the G7 rotating presidency, has taken a very hypocritical policy stance in the field of arms control. Japan has long characterized itself as a victim of nuclear explosions and an advocate of a nuclear weapons-free world. But in fact, Japan sits comfortably under the U.S. nuclear umbrella and it is against the hindering of the U.S.'s renouncing of the first use of nuclear weapons. End quote. It seems we are living in interesting times. Okay, that is today's episode of China Update. Thank you so much everybody for watching. Have a wonderful day wherever you are, and I will see you all tomorrow.